All right. Well, welcome everyone. Thank you for coming. It's so nice to be here. It's so nice to to talk to you all. You know what is also interesting? I've just realized, and in fact, some of the ladies pointed that out last time, that today is uh, like a two-year anniversary of this little gathering. Because wow. remember, we started during the times of COVID. That's when yeah. we started, and uh, it was it was uh, like I remember that end of May when we all got together in the park. All the churches were closed, like this whole lockdown and everything, and only those who truly followed the Word of God. It was so fascinating to me. We wanted to see someone, we wanted to find someone who is like-minded, was not covered by the mask, by the rules, by regulations, and all of that nonsense, which in the retrospect made know what kind of evil it actually was. Two years, two years, hard to, hard to imagine that that's what happened. Anyway, so on this anniversary, I want to talk about, I want to investigate several questions. What is, uh, what is Bible? Like, what is it? Why do we follow it? And what are the pitfalls? Like, for example, why are there so many different Bible translations in English? Like, why are there so many different translations? Is there such thing as a perfect translation? Okay? And why, in my humble opinion, and hopefully at the end of today, you will have a, a lot of evidence for that too. To this day, as far as English translations go, the King James Version appears to be the best. So it's going to be a very interesting little investigation trying to understand the issue at hand, and I'll shed a lot of history, so you'll see some interesting things that I was surprised when I found them myself, and I would love to share them with all of you today. So let's start by opening 2 Timothy 3.16, and I would say that most of you should know it by heart at this point, right? But the, the, the 3.16, those are usually, in, in the Bible, if you look into different parts of it, those are very important verses, like John 3.16, right? For God so loved the world that he sent his only son. And then 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. So all scripture is given by inspiration of God. That's a very important verse that I want everyone to keep in mind. And then there's also a related verse in the Romans, chapter 15, verse 4. So Romans 15, 4 says, For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we, through patience and comfort of the scriptures, might have hope. Whatsoever things were written before a time were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. So again, the big question is, what is the scripture? What is the Bible? Well, let's study our little lesson in the Bible by recalling that the, the Bible itself was written by about 40 different authors. That's why we have all the different books in the Bible. That's why we call it the Bible. It's in Greek, the library. It's not just a book. It's not a collection. It's, it's a collection of holy scriptures written by about 40 authors over 1,500 years in three original languages, Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek. The Old Testament is mostly written in Hebrew. There is parts of it, like parts of Daniel and the book of Esther that are written in Aramaic because those book were, books were authored and written during Babylonian exile. That's why Aramaic, which is actually very close to Hebrew. And in fact, modern Hebrew alphabet, those square letters that you'll see, those are actually Aramaic letters. The original Old Hebrew in which Moses wrote looked very different. Like, for example, letter Aleph looked like inverted A. is like a bull with two horns and things like that. Very interesting stuff. Anyways, uh, and of course, the New Testament was written, uh, was written about uh, 2,000 years ago in the times of Roman Empire. Greek language, Koine Greek, was the common language at the time. So the New Testament is written in Greek. 
So today I will focus primarily on the New Testament, uh, which was authored and written down in about the second half of the first century AD. The Old Testament is the whole other story. The Old Testament will take quite a bit of time mm -hmm. to investigate. And I want you to understand that too, because there will be differences in translations. But the New Testament is, of course, the most important to us Christians, because it's the grand finale, the culmination of all of the original developments and all of the profound insights will be found in the New Testament. But it also means that about 2,000 years have passed since the times when the New Testament was written. And the 2,000 years is a long time. And there's a separation in time and space. There's a separation in language. There's a separation in culture. Therefore, the biblical translation issue becomes of prominent importance, and it is far from trivial. Not only do we need to translate from the original language, but we also need to somehow bridge the gap of 2,000 years, as well as to find what we need to translate. So evangelical Christians embrace the doctrine of, well, let me throw in a little bit of uh, theological terms here, the, the doctrine of verbal plenary inspiration of the Bible. And again, those are just uh, formal words, but here is what it means. If you open 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 21. 2 Peter 1, 21, and those are just some, some of the key verses that I would like to point out. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Okay, so 2 Peter 1, 21. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God, holy men of God, so the select one of God, one of those 40 authors, so all of those 40 authors with different books, spoke as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Okay, so that's what, what is meant by inspired. By inspired means so it's not just some human author who was had some clever teachings in his head or whatever, but he was also actually inspired by the Holy Spirit himself to write down something that God wanted to reveal. Now, what is also interesting, there is a demonic counterpart of it. It's called automatic writing. If those people who are get foolish enough to go into the occult, sometimes they get into this activity when they try to get enter into a trance and try to write things automatically. And some of them, a lot of them are charlatans, but some of them will be taken over by wicked entities and they will write something that will become a revelation from the dark side. And that is not of God and it is an abomination and it's very dangerous to not only get engaged in that, but even keep those books and try to read them. And they're usually filled with lies and deceptions and oftentimes all kinds of gibberish and nonsense. So the inspiration in the biblical sense is when you have the Holy Spirit in cooperation with our own will and our own style. And it's one of the greatest mysteries how jointly the will of God is expressed in writing. So the Holy Spirit honors our own wishes, desires, and moves. So it's not like we're zapped in a trance. I'm mean, talking about uh, biblical writers. They wrote it in inspiration, but whatever they wrote actually came not just from them, but also from God. And you'll find the dualism a lot in the Bible, the divinity and humanity of Christ uh, and uh, the, the duality of all these different things. And it's one of those great mysteries, uh, the duality of freedom and predestination and all these other things. It's very interesting. There's also Matthew 5.18. Matthew 5.18 says, For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Now what this verse and many others particularly indicates that it's not just what is written, but even every letter of what is written has a specific meaning. And that's what Jesus is saying. This, this whole thing with the jot or tittle in the, uh, whatever Hebrew, he specifically refers to Hebrew, it would be an equivalent of our dots and crosses on I's and T's punctuation, commas, and all. They, even those days, they did not have punctuation, interestingly enough. Even in Greek, 
they all they were writing continuously without case. So there's a, a lot of the ambiguity in the Bible sometimes arises from our educated guess of where to put commas or where to put different clauses. So I mean, I, I might talk about it a little bit more as we go on. So anyways, this is the, based on these two verses, we have this doctrine of verbal plenary inspiration, which means it's not just the inspiration of God, but even individual words and letters really do matter. So the only important thing to understand here is that we're talking about the point when the writing actually took place. So the way those words and letters were written by the original inspired author is what matters. And the evangelical Christians embrace the related doctrine of biblical inerrancy, which says that the Bible in the form that this was originally written down has no error. Now, no error meaning the way it was written by the original author is inspired by God, word for word, letter by letter. And in that case, it has no error. Now, we as people may err in understanding what is written. And we should not confuse that doctrine with inerrancy. So there could be a lot of theological debates on how to understand what is written, but it does not necessarily mean that the Bible is an error. Okay? Again, I was just throwing in several things so that you know. Uh, now, here's what is interesting. Unless you know biblical Greek, you will be relying on a translation into your own native language. For example, English, or if you know Ukrainian, or be Ukrainian, or Spanish, or Italian, or right, whatever. So in our case, we are relying on a translation in English. But this introduces tremendous complications. Should we translate word for word? Because as I've just pointed out, the doctrine of biblical expiration is a verbal plenary, so it's a word for word. But in Greek, if we translate in Greek, word for word in English, it's likely that you will not be able to understand it because it's not 100% feasible. Because languages have different structures, different vocabularies, different grammar. Like even when Euro sometimes is asking me, hey, how to translate this word in English? I say, hey, wait a minute, tell me the context. Because I cannot, there's many different ways I can translate it. So I know you can see how we can get into the trouble just when we try to translate. Okay, now Greek has noun cases why English does not. So in Greek, a word, depending on whether it's subject, object, or whether it's possessive or instrumental, will have different endings. But in English, we don't have that. So there's a lot of stuff that is happening in Greek that we cannot fully translate in English. Nevertheless, having said that, and this will be the starting point for us, an attempt can be made to have a meaningful close approximation to the word-for-word -word translation. And incidentally, this is what King James authors attempted to do. And they did such a good job of this, considering the time and effort, that to this day, the Bible and the King James translation specifically is considered to be a masterpiece of literature and of scholarly work. Okay, so that will be our first starting point, which is very really important for us to understand. So this is the approach taken by the King James Version. And what you will also find out is that if you read the King James Version, some of the words are presented in Italic. I'm like, my first question was, why are they in Italic? Well, those are the words that were supplied by translators that were not in the original text. And it's very interesting to know because there's some blunders, I even know there's some stories out there that a pastor thought that those words in Italic were the important words and would come up with the entire sermon using those words in Italic, but they never really found out that they were the ones that were not actually in the original scripture, so go figure. <laughs> but, but this is how it works, okay? So keep that in mind. Now, there are also biblical translations called functional translations. Those are not necessarily translations. They're more like an inspired commentary on the Bible. Inspired or not so inspired, depending on who does that. 
Uh, but those are usually like uh, some of the well-known ones would be message or uh, passion translation. Those are the free form. And it's, uh, it's a very bad idea to try to rely on those translations to study individual words because you'll be studying the words of someone who thought that this is the words that should be supplied there. Now, if we want to study on a deep level, we want to have a translation that is on a word-by-word -word basis, and that's where the family of translations that will talk about it. Okay, now, having said all of this introduction here, we need to realize one important thing, and that is that the Satan knows Bible by heart. He was there when it was written, He's always interested in it. He is very angry about it and he wants to defeat it by whatever means possible. Like even when Jesus was tempted in the desert, remember Satan used biblical verses from the books of Deuteronomy to challenge Jesus, okay? And Jesus replied from the books of Deuteronomy very masterfully to all of those challenges. So Satan knows his business. And of course, he wants to prevent that revelation from reaching us. And he can accomplish it in two different ways, or at least two different ways. One way to do the damage is to either destroy or corrupt the original manuscripts that were transmitted from generation to generation. Because remember, when the original authors wrote it, they didn't write it on a computer or some kind of cut and stone. Some of it was cut in stone, but still, even stones over millennia, they decay, right? And you can also introduce alternative versions, and you can also do all kinds of other things. So one way the corruption can come in is by reducing, by destroying, or corrupting, or adding, or removing different words in, the, in different uh, versions as they are being transmitted from generation to generation. And the second way, to introduce damage and corruption is to basically introduce ambiguity of language translation. There's a fruitful avenue to introduce a lot of ambiguity there. So let me start with the second line first, just to give you an example. Uh, as if you were to look at John 1.1, 1, 1, in, uh, in your Bible, you'll see in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Was God with a capital G, right? But if you get the so-called New World Translation, which is the Bible that you all witnesses use, that particular heresy, then it says, a God with the little g. Now, why do they put a God in there? Well, because Russell, or whoever the creator of that cult in the upper 1800s, decided that he knew better than anyone else, and he made, came up with his own translation from the Greek, and he put that translation there. And all of the cult members, the Jehovah Witnesses, they call themselves today, they always use that translation and they point it out by basically to say that Jesus is not God. Jesus is a God and all of that. So those are, would be prime examples how we can take the original word corrupted and create an offshoot of Christianity that usually turns into a heretical sect. Now, these are very easy to spot and deal with, but believe it or not, so many people, countless millions of people have been deceived by a very easy and simple trick like that. And of course, in the cult setting, they usually have uh, the technique called isolation, deprivation, and indoctrination. So they isolate you, then they deprive you of common necessities, and then they do indoctrination using the corrupted, modified Word of God in this case. And then the person comes out of that cultic training and they already know, they think they know the truth. And they've been isolated and then I have that elitist, cultist upbringing. And uh, this is how the corruption can settle in. However, in what follows, I will focus on something that is more deep. Not trivial examples like this, even though they could be very damaging. Now, to give you several additional options. If you open Titus 1-2, in the Titus 1-2, it says, uh, in hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. Um, 
What it clearly says here is God that cannot lie. And that's what King James Version says. But if you were to open ESV translation, and the reason I'm using ESV from now on is that this is the translation I started with, which was recommended to me by a lot of professors at Biola School. And in general, a lot of people think that ESV is a great translation. But specifically here, ESV says, instead of that cannot lie, it actually says who never lies. Now, I want you to understand the fine difference here. King James translation introduces absolute God that cannot lie, end of story. But ESV says God who never lies, it doesn't necessarily mean that God cannot lie. So see, that's when we get into this word for word, deep depth, all of a sudden translation becomes very important. And of course, it's not going to matter to a baby Christian, etc. But when you mature in your understanding, that's where it becomes more and more important. And let me just give you another example. You don't have to look it up. But in the First Corinthians 11.3, that's when talk about, uh, Paul talks about the roles of man and the woman, etc. That's what he says. But I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of the woman is the man, and the head of Christ is God. Right? That's what King James says. But if you open the SV, instead of head of the, of the woman, it says, but the head of a wife is a man. And now we see all of a sudden there's a whole different shade and a whole different theological flavor that's being introduced here. And those are just, just a few examples. I'm not going to talk about those particular points right now. Now in Philippians 2, there is the passage there that says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant who was made in the likeness of man. It's a famous passage that calls about the, the doctrine of kenosis, that Jesus Christ emptied himself, right, etc., etc. And again, King James says, being in the form of God, but ESV says, who was in the form of God. Now, why does it use was? Is it kind of assuming that he no longer is? See, the King James says being in the form of God in the present tense, whereas ESV puts it in the past tense. And then ESV also, instead of but made himself of no reputation, ESV says, but made himself nothing. That makes no sense. You cannot make yourself into nothing. So see, that's how fine theological kind of shades can be introduced that move you in the direction away from what the original text presented. There is another interesting thing here, uh, and that is the, right now, remember, we're only talking about translation issues, assuming you have a Greek text here and you want to have an English translation, somewhat word for word, and the challenges that arise here and the possibilities for corruption. Now, Greek, Greek has very important grammatical distinction in the second person, singular versus plural. So when I talk to Nikita, like you, technically I'm talking to second person singular, but when I talk to all of you, I talk to second person plural. Likewise, when someone talks to someone in either singular or plural, it changes the meaning of the words. And in Greek, they are different. That's why in King James, we use the words, and you'll discover that, as thou, thee, thy, and thine. Okay, so thou is the second person subject the is the second person object, thy is a second, a second person genitive, and thine second person possessive. And if you're plural, you'll have ye as a subject, you as an object, and your yours as a possession or genitive. Then again, I use some grammatical categories because I'm fascinated with it. The point to keep in mind, in our modern Bibles, we only have you, and your and yours. But in Greek, in uh, King James, you have five more words. Thou, thee, thy, thine, and ye. And just to give you a flavor, let me give you one example. 
that I find is quite fascinating that highlights why those could be important. As you look, look chapter 22, verses 31 and 32. And uh, what happens there is that Jesus talks to Peter about what's coming. And uh, specifically, uh, if I were to read it in the modern translation, which would include, by the way, New King James. The, the New King James Version, what it does, it took the King James Version and replaced all these thou's, these thy's, etc., with you, yours as well as all of the ancient words, like some weird words that have been no longer used or some of the grammatical constructs were replaced. But otherwise, they didn't really change that much. So it's still a pretty good translation, but you will not find these flavor, the kind of colorful words in the New King James. So here's what the, what the scripture says. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has desired to have you that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for thee that thy faith fail not, and when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. This is the King James. Now, imagine that this is being converted into modern form. Then it will read as follows. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan is desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith fail not, and when you are converted, strengthen your brethren. So if you read it in the modern version, what you will realize, the intuition will tell you that Satan, that, that Jesus talks to Peter and says that Satan has decided to, to kind of, to have some problems with you, Peter, and therefore I chosen you, Peter, to do all these things. But that's not what the original text says. And you can see from King James, in the first part of it, in verse 31, Jesus talks to Peter, but he uses you and you. He talks to Peter about everyone. But then in verse 32, he switches to thee and thy. You see the difference? that you would otherwise completely miss if you did not have King James here. I know it's a fine point, but it shows the importance of Greek translation into English that honors the original difference. Jesus in this passage talks to Peter saying, Satan has chosen basically all of you desire to have all of you so he can do something with all of you, but I have prayed for thee, Peter, specifically for you, not for all, but specifically for you, that your faith will fail not. And then when thou art converted, strengthen your brethren. If you remove that thighs and these from there, you will lose the beauty of this particular conversation and how it works. Again, not, not a big point, but uh, once you get to that level, you will realize it's very interesting. So as you can see, the second line of attack is just you have the original text and you try to translate it into modern or not so modern language. And there's a lot of challenges and a lot of ambiguities and a lot of problems that can occur along the way. A lot of room for the deceiver to do all kinds of crazy things, okay? But unfortunately, the first line of deception is even more vicious, and that is corrupting the original scripture itself. And that's what I would like to talk about for the remainder of this message. Notice that until the fourth century AD, I'm just giving you a little bit of history because it's a fascinating topic and every Christian should know this. The main medium for writing was papyrus. What is a papyrus? It's a form of paper. It was made, it's a relatively fragile material made of uh, reed fibers and it could handle about 100 years of use and eventually had to be replaced by a copy. Now, modern paper cannot even handle 100 years of use. I'm pretty sure if I were to use it over and over again in a couple of years, I mean, I would have to replace it, right? So even in those days, they always had that problem of replacement, right? 
So this, combined with the three initial centuries of church persecution, as you know, Christianity comes on the scene in the first century, in the second half, and because it gets persecuted first by Jews and then by Roman, by Roman Empire. And the persecutions last for about two, three hundred years. And the church goes underground, and they use that papyrus, and they, they make copies and transmit and all of that. But they are in the underground setting, right? So that's why, starting, we, we don't really have any of the original Greek manuscripts predating 4th century. There was no way they could have survived. Yes, we have some minor fragments or exceptions here and there from 2nd century, more from the 3rd century, but we don't have the whole New Testament surviving all the way from that time. But starting with the 4th century, the church was officially recognized by the state. Remember, last time I talked about Edict of Milan, but Emperor Constantine, Emperor Theodosius, church became the official uh, by the ending of the 4th century church. The church becomes kind of... Uh, connected to the state, and uh, at that point, canon was already established, the debates about what constitutes the Bible were already done, and the books at that point were written on animal skins. So when you have the combined power of the state and the church machine and everything that goes on, at that point they were able to write more permanent copies because on animal skins, on vellum, goat skins, and etc., cetera, etc., cetera, it could last centuries and even millennia. So from that point onward, no persecution, churches basically in favor with the state, and that was, we know, was a problem for the church too. A lot of people rushed into the church and a lot of this uh, contamination entered into the church. But the good news came out of this whole thing, at least one good thing, is that they managed to create lots of copies of all of the scripture and canon, etc., etc. And that's why we have the complete versions of the Bible, usually which started with the fourth century. Not necessarily the best versions, but at least there is a possibility there. Now, all of these were meticulously used, copied, and translated into different languages. Notable translation would be a Latin translation that was adapted by the Latin, uh, Roman Catholic Church and known as Vulgate. So in the, Western, in the Western Roman Empire, Latin became official language. Church adopted this language. And the Jerome and others, they translated original Greek, I'm talking about the New Testament at this point, into Latin. And from that point on, the Roman Catholic Church is locked into Latin as their main language. Uh, scripture, the Bible, and everything. And we know that over the years, they kind of, it became a thing of its own. The Eastern Orthodox Church, on the other hand, which was central Byzantium, which is uh, Constantinople and Antioch, modern day Turkey, they continued to use Greek manuscripts. So they continued to use all of these manuscripts that were written and rewritten over and over again. And over the centuries, this gave rise to what is known as a text. Receptus, or they call it, if you translate from Latin, it's called received text. So I want you to understand the Eastern Church preserved the original Greek manuscripts, lots of them, that were used, copied, updated, etc., etc., in the form that was used over the centuries, the established canon of the Word of God in Greek. And this is what we call Textus Receptus, the received Greek text. And I have it here, for example. This is one of the books that I, I ordered a while ago. And all of this is in Greek right here. And I confirm that this is the way that was used by the, by the Eastern Church all the time, okay? What happened during the Reformation is that the new movement arose in the West against the official Latin Vulgate, because by then, no one of the normal people knew Latin, and it would have to take like 10 years of study in the Roman Catholic seminary to even get to the point when you could read the Holy Writ, right? So there was this new move in order that when they actually wanted to create a new translation from the original tongues, okay? 
And of course, when reformers wanted to get their national Bibles in German, English, whatever, they reached out to what? The received text. Because they said, we don't trust the Roman Catholic Church with their Vulgate. We're going to reach out to the original Greek, the New Testament, the received text and translate it into our own language. And this is the approach that ultimately led to the celebrated King James Version of 1611. So the most important point here to understand is that when I get the King James or the New King James, with that understanding that I just mentioned about these nouns, etc., for the New Testament part of it, the original Greek is a received text that withstood the test of time and use in the entire Eastern wing of the church. And that's very important to realize. Now, until the advent of photocopying, of course, no single King James Version edition was exactly the same. But all of the 100% of the differences were due to typos and spelling errors. And uh, I did a little bit of uh, research there, and apparently there's some very interesting collector's item Bibles there. Because if you think about it, in, in 1611, yes, we, we have the published version, right? But every time they had to publish the new batch, they had to type it from a fresh, right? And sometimes errors would creep in because they, they couldn't file a copy, they didn't have computers, they didn't have storage, right? So some printers, people would put those things together. And there's, a, there's several very interesting item, uh, versions out there. In 1631, they have a version called the Wicked Bible because the seventh commandment says, thou shalt commit adultery. <laughs> so they, <laughs> the printers forgot to put the knot there. In 1633, there's this Bible called the Unrighteous Bible because 1 Corinthians 6, 9 says, the unrighteous shall inherit the earth. Okay. The 1702 version, Psalm 119, 161, says, printers had persecuted me, printers instead of princes. So I guess one of the printers was uh, upset about that. In 1717 version, the Luke 20 says, the parable in the side notes, the parable of the vinegar instead of vineyard. So they call it the vinegar Bible. In 1795, there's a version called the Murderer's Bible because Mark 727 says, let the children first be killed instead of filled. <laughs> so, but those are some comical examples. But again, I want you to understand that there's no such thing as the King, King James Version. There's, it's a certain approximation, just like there's no such thing as the received Greek uh, because there's dips like variations here and there. But if you eliminate all of those non-essential errors, yes, you have the received text as a prototype and you have the King James Version that is based on it. Now we enter into a very interesting error. The status quo changed with the arrival of the so-called Age of Re Reason that started in 1650 and continued all the way into 1800s. It's also known as the Enlightenment. Now, the gradually, our reason was elevated into the highest position of worship. But the sad thing happened is basically what it's, uh, the, 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 the way the doctrine entered is that we cannot arrive at certain metaphysical truths by the power of reason alone, that the everything is open to question, and silence became the ultimate arbiter and took upon itself the role of our Supreme God. And in the 1800s, we have the arrival of Darwinism on the scene. And the Darwinism replaced natural theology, creationism, and all these other uh, movements. And the following the suit, liberal Christianity started questioning the validity and the infallibility of the Bible itself. And we have the arrival on the scene of so-called higher biblical criticism and its minor offshoot textual criticism. So in the age of reason, People started saying, hey, look, we no longer trust this, we trust our reason more. 
and we want to validate everything in here with our reason. And we literally took upon ourselves the role, the role of God, right? Now remember what the story of Adam and Eve in Genesis 3, 1, 5? Let me read it to you quickly from the King James Version. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, has God said, ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Notice how Satan already introduces lie in here. He plants the doubt into Eve and says, every tree of the garden. And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And notice how Eve replaced, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. Eve has already been indoctrinated into something that God didn't say, because God only forbid to eat it, not to touch it. But Eve is already saying not to touch it. It's kind of interesting how some of these corruptions enter into these relationships. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die, for God doth know that in the day either of that your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil, and ye shall be as gods. So what happened in the 19th century is exactly that. People took upon themselves the role of gods, and they thought that they know better. And uh, by the way, the big question is, what, why would Eve converse with Satan in the first place? Like, it's not like that you have that conversation recorded in the Bible and as if it's something happened like right away. So it clearly Eve was already on good terms with Satan, if you think about it. Because he wouldn't just come and immediately corrupt and attempt her. He would have probably developed some kind of relationship with her. And again, it's an inference, but it kind of tells us about the dangers of communicating with those who are of corrupt mind and those who are trying to deceive, because we don't want to follow the suit of Eve. But this is what's happening in the 19th century, okay? So it took a century of about higher uh, biblical criticism to enter into high gear, and we are arriving now at the two important figures in that process, the culmination of this whole tendency. There's two guys, two scholars, two researchers with the name Hort and Westcott, and you probably heard Jim mentioning those names. So I've decided to dig in a little bit more and give you a little bit more of the background of what's happening here. Hort and Westcott. Now, when we study someone at that level, especially when you, let's say you look at the Bible, you want to buy a biblical commentary in a store or something, and it's a good idea to study what are the views of those people who wrote that commentary? Would you like to buy a Jehovah's Witnesses commentary on the Bible? Probably not, right? Or Mormons? No, probably not, right? <laughs> because it's not a good idea. So it's important, it's instructive to look at what Horst and Westcott, what kind of theology they believed in. So let me read some quotes directly from their books and writings. If you're interested, I can cite those, but uh, uh, it's uh, kind of validated it. Here's what Westcott said. I reject the word infallibility of Holy Scriptures overwhelmingly. Over what? Overwhelmingly reject the infallibility of the Scriptures. Mm -hmm. Here's what Westcott said. Our Bible as well as our faith is a mere compromise. Okay, here's what, here's what Hort said. Evangelicals seem to me perverted. There are, I fear, still more serious differences between us on the subject of authority, especially the authority of the Bible. Now, evangelicals, remember, we have the doctrine of uh, inerrancy of the Bible, the doctrine of plenary verbal inspiration, etc., etc., but they, Hort calls it perverted, okay? Here is what Westcott said. He, Christ, meaning Christ, never speaks of himself directly as God, but the aim of his revelation was to lead man to see God in. That's a heretical move to downgrade the divinity of Christ, right? And Westcott said that John doesn't expressly affirm the identification of the word with capital W with Jesus Christ, okay? Westcott said, hell is not the place of punishment of the guilty. It is the common abode of departed spirits. 
And then Ford also said, we have no sure knowledge of future punishment. And the word eternal has a far higher meaning, well, whatever he means. Westcott said, no one now, I suppose, holds that the first three chapters of Genesis, for example, give a literal history. I could never understand how anyone reading them with open eyes could think they did. Okay, that's Westcott. Now, Hort, in unison, cites by the book which has most engaged me is Darwin. Whatever may be thought of it, it is a book that one is proud to be contemporary with. My feeling is strong that the theory is unanswerable. So Hort is a Darwinist, so is Westcott. They're enamored with all of that, etc., etc. Westcott also says, I wish I could see to what forgotten truth, Mariolatry, that's the worship of the Virgin Mary, bears witness. So it's almost like Westcott says, oh, there must be something important about all of that worship of Mary. And then Hort said, the pure Roman Catholic Church view seems to be nearer and more likely to lead to the truth more than the evangelical. Okay, and then finally, here is uh, not what they said, but it's uh, from the Hermes Club and the Ghostly Guild. This is what uh, that particular, uh, there's some description of them. In one thing, to have doctrinal differences on baby sprinkling and perhaps a few other interpretations, it is another to be a Darwin-believing theologian who rejects the authority of scriptures, biblical salvation, the reality of hell, and makes Christ the created being to be worshipped with Mary his mother. Yet these were the views of both Westcott and Hort. No less significant is the fact that both men were members of spiritist societies. So those two guys, now we know their views. It's very important. But interestingly enough, those two were single-handedly responsible from taking this and revising this into this. This is called the Nestle Allen Greek English New Testament. And when you compare Greek in here, and Nestle Allen, they just continued the work that Horton Westcott started. And there's also a UBS version in the United Bible Society or something like that. They took textus receptus and they critically revised it into a new text. Revised it, and you'll see in a moment, I'll, I'll give you several examples, which I think is quite instructive. Now, how did they manage to revise it? They introduced two rules. They said, we're not going to trust Textus Receptus. It's garbage. They're words. It's not trustworthy. We're going to look at all these original manuscripts and reassemble everything from scratch. And the rule number one says, all the readings, manuscripts, or manuscript groups should be preferred. So older, the better. And the rule number two, Readings are approved or rejected by reason of their quality. So we'll use our own reason to decide what is approved, what is rejected. They introduce more rules too. There's like 10, 12, 15 of them. But those are the key ones. And uh, we could summarize it as the older, the better. Now remember that the reason why we have text is receptus or receive text is because the church preserved it by writing and rewriting but we no longer have the original versions. There were a lot of original versions in the beginning, original manuscripts, but they were all retired over centuries, over millennia. But we do have several very early manuscripts that were discovered in the mid 1800s. And now we have a very interesting historical trend that coincides with Hort and Westcott. Now, the first find is the so-called Codex Vaticanus, also known as Codex B. It is known to have existed in Vatican Library since mid-1400s and is dated to the first century. And in 1867, and it was discovered by Constantine Mastischeldorf and was published as a manuscript by 1880s uh, by, by Vatican. So we have all of a sudden in the midst of all of this Darwinism and criticism and higher criticism, somehow miraculously this dusty manuscript is discovered in the recesses of Vatican, 
dated by the fourth century. And it's pulled out. And it's like, oh, there is an old one right here. Now, here's what the New Westminster Dictionary of the Bible says about that manuscript. It should be noted, however, there is no prominent biblical manuscript in which there occurs such gross cases of misspelling, faulty grammar, and omission as in Vaticanus manuscript. And the other scholars concur. That particular manuscript has so many errors and all kinds of problems with it that it's not even clear why it was preserved in Vatican Library. But it's clear that that's probably why they never used it because it was so bad. So it was never, it's just, you know, take a, a bad version, you never touch it, it can stay for a long time. But now it popped up. There was a second discovery. In a very similar time frame, there was a NASA manuscript discovered called this Codex Aleph, and it's also known as Codex Sinaiticus. Sinaiticus. It was discovered by the same guy, Konstantin Tishelov. He was an avid kind of, you know, hunter for ancient manuscripts, etc. Uh, it was discovered that St. Catherine's Monastery at the foot of Mount Sinai, you know, the Sinai Peninsula, uh, right there, and there is a tradition that names Mount Sinai as being right there on the south tip, and they have a Saint uh, uh, Catherine's Monastery there. Uh, I, by the way, I subscribe to an alternative view that Mount Sinai is in northwestern uh, Arabia, which is basically Saudi Arabia part and all of that, because it's just a lot more uh, in the land of Midianites and all of that, uh, but, but that's another subject. So this one was discovered in this manuscript. And interestingly enough, the discovery was again entirely by accident, quote unquote, because the monks were planning to burn many of the pages due to questionable quality. And then 15 years later, uh, uh, the Düsseldorf managed to recover the entire codex from the monks by, by paying money, etc. And this is what the, the discoverer of the manuscript says about the manuscript himself. The New Testament portion is extremely unreliable. On many occasions, 10, 20, 30, 40 words are dropped. Letters, words, even whole sentences are frequently written twice over or begun and immediately canceled. The gross blunder whereby a clause is omitted because it happens to end in the same word as the clause preceding occurs no less than 115 times in the New Testament. It gets worse. So we have two manuscripts that somehow discovered one in the center of Vatican, which by then we already know what it turned into. The other one of this questionable origin that monks themselves wanted to burn because they thought it would be useless. But they are dated to the fourth century and they are believed to have originated in Alexandria. Alexandria is the north tip of Africa by the Nile right there. And Alexandria is the known center of Gnosticism. And you know what Gnostics were? It's a second century heretical movement that the Satan was trying to unleash to pervert Christianity. And they were denying the goodness of physical. Gnostics were saying that the spiritual is good, physical is bad. Therefore, Jesus could not have come in the flesh because flesh is always corrupt. And they would always come up with these heretical theories saying that Jesus just had a form of a man and he never really died and all of that. That's why 1 John that we studied was Jim. The prime target of 1 John was written at the end of the first century was to attack the rise of the Gnosticism. That's why John makes the big deal saying, but whoever says that Jesus Christ did not come in the flesh is Antichrist. Clear, it was very clear on that. There was a huge thing, but these manuscripts come from the area where Gnosticism was a known issue from the fourth century. Now, imagine what will happen if we combine these two finds with these two guys, Hort and Westcott, and their principle, the older, the better. What you will discover is that all of a sudden, you flip the foundation. You now start with these two manuscripts, and because they are the oldest, they're going to dominate the rest of that so-called textual criticism, critical work. Most 
modern Bibles, and I have those, and you'll see it in the SV, you'll see it in all these other, they say they usually have a footnote sometimes that says the earliest and the best manuscripts do not contain such and such passage. What they do not tell us is that they're almost universally talking about these two manuscripts and only these two manuscripts. Now, I remember when I was reading ESV version, and I read the ending of Mark 16, you know, when it says, uh, basically, uh, and Jesus told them, go ye into the whole world and preach the gospel unto every creature. And whoever believeth shall be saved. Whoever believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Whoever believeth not shall be damned. And these signs shall follow them who believe. In my name they shall cast out devils and speak with the new tongues. They shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay their hands on the sick, and they shall recover. If you open up any modern version, this whole verse, the collection is even bigger, says, oops, the earliest manuscripts do not include it. Can you imagine the doubt that it sheds on so many readers of the Bible if they take those verses seriously? What they do not tell you is that they mean those two manuscripts, Alexandrian origin, San Sinaiticus and Vaticanus, do not have that. Well, of course they don't have that, because that particular ending of Mark 16, they call it the long ending of Mark 16, demolishes all of these heretical doctrines that we talked about before. Anyway, so now you understand what happened. And uh, I want to show you a little bit of flavor. If you take the received text and you take the Hort and Westcott text, which is a modern incarnation would be a, a Nestle Allen text. If you compare that, and I didn't do it, I just confirmed all the differences that people have heard. Here's what you want to discover. If you open Matthew 7, verses 15 through 20, it says, Beware of false prophets, which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. You shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or fig of thistles? Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but the corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth not good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Wherefore, by their fruits you shall know them. So what Jesus tells us here in the matters of importance, especially when we're talking about the original manuscripts. It is very important that we have the right character doing it and the right understanding and inspiration. And we could get down into all kinds of scholastic debates and the scholarly debates and saying, oh, that is that argument, that argument, that argument. I want to bypass it all and simply show you the fruits of the work of Hort and Westcott and all of the followers. The fruit that is found in every modern Bible translation other than King James and New King James. So let's, let me show just several examples. Matthew 6, 13, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power of the glory forever, amen, amen. The part, the doxology, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever, amen, was removed by Horton Muscat. It was removed, erased. And you'll see that the modern Bibles, it's marked with that. Oh, not found in the original manuscripts. Matthew 5.22 says, But I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. The modern versions remove without a cause. So they simply say, whosoever is angry with his brother shall be in danger of the judgment. And again, I'm not setting up on theological points of it all, just to show you that the differences are significant. They are not like innocuous. 
Matthew 9, 13. But go ye and learn what that meaneth. I will have mercy and not sacrifice. For I am not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Modern versions remove to repentance. It simply says to call the righteous, but sinners. But the received text says, but the sinners to repentance. We have to repent first. It's not just once pronounced sinner's prayer and you're kind of basically always saved. Matthew 13, 51, remove the word Lord has been removed. Matthew 17, 21, it says, How bait this kind goes not out by prayer and fasting. None goes not out but by prayer and fasting. This fasting thing is very important, but this whole verse is excluded from modern Bibles. You will not see it there. You'll see verse 1720 followed by 1722. 1721 is missing. And at best, you'll have a footnote. If it's a, you know, a honest translation, they'll say, oh, well, some manuscripts have that added there, okay? Similarly, Matthew 18, 11, for the Son of Man has come to save that which was lost. You will not find Matthew 18, 11 in modern translations. It's been dropped. Matthew 20, 16, so the last shall be first and the first last, for many be called, but few chosen. The second half, for many be called, but few chosen, is not in the modern versions. Matthew 23, 14, woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye devour windows houses, and for a pretense make long prayer. Therefore ye, for a pretense make long prayer. Therefore ye shall receive the greater damnation. Matthew 23, 14 is not found in the Vaticanus and prayer. Well, because it would be a very great <laughs> condemnation of what is practiced oftentimes in uh, common denominations. Make a pretense, make a long prayer. Right, woe to you Pharisees. In Matthew 27, 35, and they crucified him and parted his garments, casting lots. That's the crucifixion scene. And then King James continues, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet. They parted my garments among them and upon my vesture did they cast lots. This second part is completely omitted, which is incidentally a quote from Psalm 22, 18. Now, Psalm 22 is the number one psalm that any Christian should know because Psalm 22 is Jesus speaking directly from the cross. Of course, it's written a thousand years before through King David and it's inspired by David, but it describes what someone who's being crucified actually feels. It's a first person description of crucifixion, that's Psalm 22. That reference has been removed. Yeah, you can still find it if you dig in, but why would you remove and obscure something that is so helpful, especially for baby Christians who are just beginning to understand the riches of the word? Mark 3.15 says, and to have power to heal sicknesses and to cast out devils. But the Vaticanus and Sinaiticus removed to heal sicknesses. Because remember, Gnostics, they didn't believe in miracles and they didn't like all that, you know, body stuff, physical stuff. And by the way, there were two different flavors of uh, Gnostic abomination. The, their one line of Gnosticism moved in the direction, they're basically saying, okay, if the body is bad, we should mutilate it, we should deny it, we should, it's all of these type of uh, uh, extreme asceticism, like the denial of the flesh, all of that and all of that, which is obviously not the way God wants us to be. There was another movement too, which is all like extreme hedonism. So they would engage in all kinds of sexual perversions. They would say, hey, it doesn't matter, body is bad, whatever. So when we live here, we might as well indulge in everything that we want. Let's have some sexual orgies, let's, let's enjoy it, whatever, that doesn't matter. So see, that's the dangers of Gnosticism. That's what they were trying to justify. 
or, or this is the output, the logical follow-up of all of these doctrines. So it's very important. Mark 6, 11 says, And whosoever shall not receive you nor hear you, when ye depart thence, shake off the dust on your feet for a testimony against them. Verily I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. The second part about Sodom and Gomorrah is excluded from all of the modern versions. And again, it's, it's a very important uh, indicator, right? Uh, Mark 10, 24 says, And the disciples were astonished at his words, but Jesus answered again and says unto them, Children, how hard it is for them that trust in riches to enter into the kingdom of God. Modern versions remove the part for them that trust in riches, which totally changes and cut, obscures the meaning. Mark eleven twenty six says, But if ye do not forgive, neither will your Father, which is in heaven, forgive your trespasses. Sounds like a very important doctrinal statement, right? If ye do not forgive, neither will your Father, which is in heaven, forgive your trespasses. But that verse is not found in the original, in the modern Bibles. It was excluded. Mark 15, 28, And the scripture was fulfilled, which says, And he was numbered with the transgressors. It's excluded from modern versions. Mark 16, 9 through 20, I already mentioned it before. That's about this thing about uh, uh, preach the gospel to every creature and healing the sick and laying hands and uh, casting out devils. And this whole like massive theology, the entire Pentecostal church is founded on Mark 16. Well, this one is, they didn't have boldness to remove it completely because I guess that would make a lot of Christians upset. But if you open any modern Bible, they put it in square brackets and say, oh, well, that, that's not in the original manuscripts. It's that the implication as well. That's probably not part of the original inspiration. Okay. Luke 11, 2, 4. It says, and he said unto them, when ye pray, say, now we're talking about Lord's Prayer. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. Thy will be done as in heaven, so in earth. Interestingly enough, this Fort and Westcott manuscript excludes our which art in heaven. It just puts Father there. And it excludes thy will be done as in heaven, so in earth. That whole important part is dropped. And then also says, and forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone that is indebted to us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. But deliver us from evil is only in King James Version in Texas Receptus, not in the modern versions. And they say, oh, well, that's, that's just, look, look, didn't write that. So <laughs> another great example is John 7, 53 through 8, 11. Remember that beautiful story about the woman caught in adultery that brought in front of Jesus. And then Jesus writing in the sand and they're trying to accuse her of adultery and say, they say, oh, yeah, just stone her, etc., etc." And then Jesus says, let first who is without sin to cast the first stone. Well, if you read, again, it was not removed from modern Bibles, but it was put in brackets. And if you read them, you'll see that comment there, oh, it's not in the original manuscripts. And I remember I was reading it in the SV, and I was like, oh, wow, I mean, that's, like, why? Like, oh, it's such a beautiful story. Like, what's going on there? Now I know that I should ignore that silly comment in the Bible, because all it means, it's not in the original Vaticanus and Sinaiticus manuscripts. Well, so what? <laughs> the church preserved it, and it was in the original manuscripts. Just because we don't have them physically doesn't mean it's not there. But I kind of see, I yeah, wanted to share with you the flavor of things that normal Christians, they never really get down to that point. And it gets very challenging to sort things out. There's a ton of different opinions and people get very emotional about it and throwing out all these claims, oh, King James only, that only, that only. They get very upset 
I just wanted to present some facts and just show you, lay it out for you. Be, you be the judge. I'm explaining my position and I'm supporting it by specific findings that I see and uh, what is going on. In John 16, 16, now the Gospel of John, there's a many changes there, but 16, 16 is uh, instructive. A little while and ye shall not see me, and again, a little while and ye shall see me, because I go to the Father. The modern versions remove because I go to the Father. So again, it kind of removes a major part of the important theology here. Another one here, Book of Acts, chapter eight. Remember the story of Philip and the eunuch and all of that? 8.37 says, And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Hey, but you will not find 8.37 in modern Bibles. It's dropped. You see Acts 38.36, and then you see 38. What happened to 37? Well, hopefully there will be a footnote in the Bible. But I don't think even NIV might include that footnote. Some Bibles are printed without footnotes, okay? So keep that in mind. Romans chapter eight, which is a powerful, profound chapter, one of my favorite. And it begins with this unbelievable promise and hope. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, comma, comma who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. But this thing after the comma was removed in modern versions. This you say, there's no fun, therefore no condemnation of them which are in Christ Jesus. And, well, that's all they say. But what Paul really says, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. That brings us to this whole theology of, okay, should we follow our flesh or our spirit? because we're, we're not Gnostics, we're not denying our flesh. And when Paul talks about flesh, he talks about the old man, who we were before we converted, before we became renewed by the Holy Spirit. But Paul says there's no condemnation, condemnation to those who walk after the new flesh, not the old flesh. But if you remove that, then it creates an illusion that, oh, well, there's no condemnation, whatever. Just say your sinner's prayer, and you're fine. No, it's much deeper than that. Romans 13, 9 excludes thou shalt not bear false witness when uh, there's a list of uh, 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 some of the important uh, Ten Commandments that thou shalt not bear false witness for whatever reason is drawn. Colossians 3, 6, for which things sake the wrath of God cometh. Modern version stops there. But King James says, on the children of disobedience. Again, why would you have to remove that? And so Colossians is a powerful, deep theology. It's like riches of revelation coming in that book. First Timothy 6, 5 says, perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds and destitute of the truth, supposing that gain is godliness, from such withdraw thyself. This from such withdraw, so thyself is removed from modern versions. And 1 John 4, 3 says, And every spirit that confesses, confesses not Jesus Christ is come in the flesh, is not of God. Modern versions remove is come in the flesh. <laughs> that, that's, that's the mark of Alexandrian origin of those two manuscripts. They didn't like this verse because it's a direct combination of Gnosticism. So what the best way to, to fight back? Well, it's just erase it from there. I will not have it, okay? And of course, another glaring example is 1 John 5, 7. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. This verse is not found in modern versions. This whole thing, 1 John 5, 7, is dropped. They have 5, 6, followed by 5, 8. And there are three that testify on earth, the blood, the water, and the spirit, or something like that. 
But this one, the three things to be recorded in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one, has been completely excluded. Now again, we can arrive at the doctrine of the Holy Trinity by other means, but why remove the best description and summary of what it means, right? Well, for Gnostics, that was, again, something that they didn't like, and it was dropped. And then in the book of Revelation, 1.11 says, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. This whole I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last has been removed. And then we also, Jim pointed out in Revelation 5, 9, 10, and they sung a new song saying, Thou art worthy, etc. Thou hast redeemed us to God by thy blood and hast made us unto our God kings and priests. All the modern versions include them, 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 instead of us, right? So those are very important points and uh, it is important to understand. You will also discover that the word Lord has been removed from Matthew 13, 51, 28, 6, Mark 9, 24, Luke 9, 57, 22, 31, 23, 42, Romans 6, 11, 1 Corinthians 15, 47, then 2 Corinthians 4, 10, Galatians 6, 17, 1 Timothy 1, 1, 1 Timothy 5, 21, 2 Timothy 4, 1, Titus 1, 4, 2 John 1, 3, Jude 1, 4, and Revelation 16, 5. Why? I'm asking you why the word Lord was removed. It's found here and it's not found in here. Some people would say minor thing, it's not minor to me. And now you see it for yourself. You see it for yourself. And you know, the, there's an old saying, the road to hell is paved with best intentions. And when I look at this, I kind of realize well, they're judging by the fruit of all that work and all of the results that we see for ourselves, especially when we look at the starting point, who did it, and uh, based on what manuscripts it was done, and what are the fruits of it. In my mind, there is no more question which version I should use, as far as the New Testament goes. And this is why I saw has decided to use King James Version. Yes, some parts are hard to read, some parts takes time to kind of wrap your head around, but if we can master those five words, thou, thee, thy, thine, and ye, and master them in terms of, it's only five words, it's a very elegant grammar and any of the good modern King James Version translations. They will mark all these difficult to understand words with little either asterisks or T's or whatever. And in the margins, you'll see it. You'll see what that word means. So they'll give you alternative explanations. And there's also dictionaries published on some of these weird words that found in the Bible. So if you do your own search, you'll see it's not really a big deal. It, it's not that hard to read. And you could consult some of the modern versions for some very hard passages, presumably, but use them more like as a commentary, not as the authoritative word of God. And that's why for myself, and thanks to Jim and his advice and everything and all of, as I follow the Berean recommendation, right, search the scriptures, don't just trust what someone else says, verify it for yourself. This is what I did. I spent quite a bit of time and convinced myself beyond reasonable doubt that this is the version I will use, specifically for the New Testament. The Old Testament is a slightly different story, uh, maybe for another time, another message. The Old Testament, now we get into some more interesting stuff like Masoretic text, the Septuagint, and uh, at some other time, maybe I might share some thoughts on that. But even with that, King James is still a very good version, even on that side. And no modern version is better than King James. So I would even summarize, to me, King James version is not ideal. There are some problems and issues in it that I learned. But of all the versions that we have in English, it's still the best. 
And if you can't handle archaic, well, then at least settle on New King James. It's easier to read, but you will lose some of that beauty and some of that uh, expressiveness. So uh, I'll end with Revelation 22, verses 13. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city. For without are dogs and sorcerers and whoremongers and murderers and idolaters and whosoever loveth and maketh a lie. I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify to you these things in his churches. I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright and morning star. And the spirit and the bride say, come, and let him that heareth stay come, and let him that is a thirst come, and whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. For I testify unto every man that hears the words of the prophecy of this book, if, if, any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. He which testifies these things says, surely I come quickly, amen. Even so, come, Lord Jesus, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. And I pray, I pray that God has mercy on those who did this. They probably did it with the best intentions, but I pray that God has mercy on them and that they will not fall under the clause of if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life. So I'd like to close with this. Father, we humbly surrender ourselves to you. And Lord, fill our hearts with that understanding of the significance of your word. And do not let us to be driven away by lies and deceptions, because we know that the, at the end of days, many will be deceived. And so, Lord, purify our hearts, free us from anger, free us from all of the wrong things, so that we can be faithful to you and your word, and always be your faithful followers. For that we pray in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen.